So I called up my friend before us, Mark. I said, Mark, what, what the heck? Um, you know, you sent a rest in peace bouquet to my friend who nearly died of melanoma. And he was, oh my God, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And I said, well, you know, I'm sure it's no big deal. Don't worry about it. It's not the end of the world. And he said, no, you don't understand. There were two deliveries that day. And if your friend got the one that said rest in peace, the one that went to the funeral said, good luck in your new location. <laughs> So I'm not going to talk too much about the compassionate choices of Washington. We've handed out brochures that uh, talk about who we are and what we do. But I am the executive director of the Washington State Affiliate of Compassionate Choices, and we were formed by the merger of what was the Hemlock Society of Washington and Compassion and Dying of Washington. In 2005. And by the way, Compassion and Dying, half of the National Organization of Compassion and Choices, was founded in Washington, in Seattle, Washington, in 1993, following the 1991 initiative to try and pass a Death of Dignity Act that failed in Washington. And we're a nonprofit. We advocate for patients' rights, for expanding care at the end of life. We provide free client support services. We have 40 volunteers across the state of Washington that educate terminally ill people and incurably ill people, not just terminally ill people, about their end of life options, including the option of using the Death of Dignity Act. We also um, created the coalition that passed Initiative 1000, the Washington Death of Dignity Act, with nearly 60% of the vote. Uh, it was 2008. Was the Obama election turnout was going to be high. Um, that was a strategic decision that was made. We also knew that the Catholic Church was going to be busy with trying to defeat the gay marriage initiative on the ballot in California. You'll see more about that later. The law also passed in 30 of Washington's 39 counties, so our victory was delicious. So it was wonderful. So let's talk a little bit about the Catholic Church. Now there's a book that's edited by Tim Quill, a palliative care physician, and Peggy Batten, who's been here at this uh, conference. And one chapter of that is by a man named Eli Stutzman, one of the heroes in the death of dignity movement in the United States. And it's essential reading for anyone considering the passage of a death of dignity act or death of dignity legislation anywhere in the United States. And one of the things that Eli says is there's really only one opponent to death of dignity or even dying in the United States. And that opponent is the Catholic Church. Now, organized medicine is opposed to death of dignity, but they don't have they don't have the organization and the finances and the strategic power that the Catholic, the, the political arm of the Catholic Church has. Look at the amounts of money that the Church has raised and contributed to the opposition campaign since 1991. And now look at the year 2008, and notice how the amount dropped down to less than 50%. That's because the Church was pouring money into, into California to try to defeat the legalization of gay marriage. So, um, lots of money. So this is the first way that the Catholic Church defies death and dignity by trying and frequently succeeding in preventing the passage of legal aid and dying laws. So the Washington Death and Dignity Act, like all the Death and Dignity Acts in Washington, and it seems from what I hear about uh, what's happening in Europe, is that it's an opt-in law, meaning that no physician can be compelled to participate. No pharmacist can be compelled to fill a prescription for life-ending medication. No psychologist or psychiatrist must confirm a patient's capacity to participate in the law. And it allows also 
providers whole medical systems to opt out of providing so long as they notify the community about their policies. Obviously, Catholic providers have all opted out of participation in the Death and Dignity Act. That's not surprising. The statutory definition of participation, however, does not include referring patients and providing information, and the law is very clear about that. Another thing the law is very clear about is that death with dignity or participating in the law is not suicide. Suicide remains a class, assisting a suicide remains a class C felony in Washington. So there's a very clear difference between the practice of assisting a suicide and death with dignity, or aid in dying. And if you think about it for a moment, you know, you don't want people, people with life insurance to be penalized because their death certificate says that they committed suicide. You want those life insurance policies, you want that death certificate to say that the cause of death is the underlying disease. And the law requires that in Washington. So what happens when the culture of life, the so-called culture of life, I should say, collides with the majority's choice of even dying? Not sure if you can read this, but it's three buildings and under this banner culture of life. One says the division of electrocution and lethal injections. Another says the division of thwarting advances in medicine, and the other is the division of warming. It's incredible how many people who are opposed to death with dignity and, and aid in dying are also in favor of the death penalty, which, by the way, is involuntary euthanasia, which we strongly oppose, um, as I think as a movement, the idea that people are put to death against their, their wish. So the basis of Catholic opposition are the ethical and religious directives for healthcare. But before we get to that, I just want to read from the ethical and religious for healthcare, really sort of the defining statement when it comes to how Catholics, and the Catholic hierarchy, I should say, and let me be clear, when I'm talking here, we're talking about the policies of the Catholic hierarchy, not lay Catholics. In Washington, Lay Catholics voted, half of them voted in favor of the Death and Dignity Act, according to exit polls in Washington. And virtually all of them approve of contraception. But the hierarchy of the church believes that we are not the owners of our lives, and hence do not have absolute power over life. We have a duty to preserve our life and to use it for the glory of God. But the duty to preserve life is not absolute, for we may reject life prolonging procedures that are insufficiently beneficial or excessively burdensome. Suicide and euthanasia are never, are never morally acceptable options. So you have to understand the church sees us as not in control of our lives, not having the power to decide to end our own lives. These ethical Religious directives were created and modified by the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, currently in the fifth edition. The directives promote, protect the truths of the Catholic Church as those truths are brought to bear on concrete issues in healthcare. They're subject to interpretation by local bishops. In some areas we have rather progressive bishops, and in some areas we have extremely conservative bishops. Since the Pope the last pope was very active in promoting conservative bishops. We have, currently in the United States, we're sort of burdened with a whole crop of new, very conservative bishops who are interpreting the ethical and religious directives in a very conservative way. It applies to sponsors, trustees, administrators, chaplains, physicians, pharmacists, everybody including patients or residents of Catholic institutions or services, including hospitals, long-term care facilities. Now, the ethical and religious directives are actually some pretty good reading. Um, there's a lot in there about the mystery of Christ, and for someone who's maybe not an atheist or agnostic, it might seem uninteresting, but there's also a lot of good in the ethical and religious directives. There's statements in there about 
social justice, around health care, around the provision of care, around charitable care. Uh, there's actually a lot of good in the directives. But um, unfortunately, from our perspective, the, the good is more than, more than balanced, overbalanced by the bad. Not surprisingly, these ethical and religious directives get translated into policies that healthcare providers are required to um, follow. This is a brochure for the medical staff, and it addresses issues around conflict of interest and things like that. And I just, I just excerpted the policy on ethical and religious directives. And note that it says we require adherence to all ethical and religious directives as a condition of medical privileges and employment. Now, these, this adherence can also be applied to physicians who have hospital privileges at Catholic facilities, and it can also apply to physicians and others who rent space or lease space in a Catholic-owned property. The reach of these directives is expansive, very, um, it's amazing how it permeates almost all levels of healthcare in healthcare institutions. So I want to actually let you know what some of the ethical and religious directives are. Obviously, euthanasia is an action or omission that of itself by intention causes death in order to alleviate suffering. I've already said how the Catholic Church can't participate. But think about that. Euthanasia as an omission of care. Now, when I think about the omission of care, I think about uh, stopping treatment, the choice of people to voluntarily stop treatment. That's, that's the way most of us are going to die in this country. Someone, either us or a legal surrogate decision maker, is going to make a decision to terminate life support. Now, the church says that Terminating life support or stopping treatment can actually be considered euthanasia. Now, I consider that to be allowing a natural death. So whenever you see the word omitted or omission in a document, like the popular advanced directive called Five Wishes, you know that there's a Catholic, there's a Catholic behind that document, a Catholic organization or a Catholic individual. Five Wishes has a, has a stealth statement in it about, I do not want anything uh, uh, omitted from my care that would result in my death. That reflects the Catholic ethical and religious directive. The second bullet here, that says people in a persistent vegetative state, there's an obligation to continue nutrition and hydration if that person, if keep that person alive. This is sort of as a result of the Terry Shiloh situation. In that situation, the church felt that Terry Shiloh should continue to receive medically assisted nutrition and hydration, even though she was in a persistent vegetative state and would never recover from that. This one is rather medieval. Patients should be kept free of pain as possible, since the person has the right to prepare for his or her death while fully conscious. He or she may not be deprived of consciousness without a compelling reason. Patients experiencing suffering that cannot be alleviated should be helped to understand, or appreciate rather, the Christian understanding of redemptive suffering. Now, I work with people who work for Catholic providers in Washington, Providence, Franciscan, Peace Health, and they just cringe at this directly. Uh, it's you know, the idea that you know that you could explain to someone who doesn't share your faith that well, it's okay for you to suffer because we believe in redemptive suffering. I think that's rather offensive. Finally, this last one, which really concerns many people in Washington, whose only choice for medical care is at a Catholic facility, free and informed judgment made by a competent adult, or actually in another directive it says they're legal surrogate decision maker, um, concerning the use of withdrawal of life-sustaining procedures should be always respected and normally complied with unless it is contrary to Catholic moral teaching. So this creates anxiety of the idea, well, will my living well, will my 
my choices be respected at a Catholic institution? And that's a fair question. A lot of it has to do with the local bishop. Because if there's a controversy, the person that will actually decide is not a team of physicians. If it's controversial enough, it will be the bishop, who may not know anything about medical or end of life care. So that's a problem. In many places in Washington, the only place you can go to get care or emergency care if you happen to have a car accident when you're driving by is a Catholic facility. I'm not sure if you can see this, but it's your end of life wishes honored here with an asterisk, and the asterisk says, unless it's against our religious teaching. So how do Catholic providers defy the death and dignity in Washington? They prohibit the participation in death and dignity by physicians and other providers, and that's permitted by law. They adopt gag rules prohibiting the discussion of the option with patients, meaning they tell social workers, nurses, physicians, you're not allowed to talk about this. You can't give people information about this. Withhold information about the option of death with dignity. They prohibit referrals to organizations like Compassion and Choices, or they prohibit all referrals, or when they do make a referral, they refer to an organization that can't provide any meaningful assistance except a referral to Compassion and Choices of Washington, which some of them do. But that lets the church feel that they're not participating in death with dignity. So they don't give the person a direct referral, they give the referral to someone who will refer to us. And that's called reduction in complicity, which is a very important uh, concept within the Catholic hierarchy as well. And these Gag rules, these prohibitions on referrals, are actually enabled by federal and state refusal clauses. And note that I call them refusal clauses and not conscience clauses. I think it's important to call these things what they are. Now, in this country, these refusal clauses started in the early 70s. Some of you may remember, a, uh, I think, a senator, Frank Church. And the Church Amendment was one of the first federal refusal clauses, and it allowed physicians to opt out of participating in abortion. And of course, there are uh, laws in Medicare and other federal programs that prohibit any participation in abortion, that pro prohibit participation in death with dignity. That's why the Veterans Administration physicians can't participate in the death with dignity act. And here's how these policies also get interpreted. This is a Catholic hospice uh, in Seattle, in the Seattle area. Staff and volunteers may not provide referrals, period. It doesn't say referrals to us, the Compassion and Choices of Washington. It just says no referrals. Expresses an interest in the death of the in the act or an intent to follow through, they refer to his or her physician. And what happens when the physician is working for a Catholic provider? who's not allowed to talk about death with dignity or not allowed to refer. In fact, a few months ago, a hospice patient in living in Everett, a man suffering from a brain tumor, asked his hospice social workers and nurses for information about the Death with Dignity Act. And, as per Providence's rules, he was referred back to his physician who worked for Providence Hospital in Everett. The physician didn't tell him it wouldn't provide any information. He wasn't aware of compassion and choices. He was an elderly man. He didn't have access to the internet, or he didn't have family who were willing to look and do research for him. And so he climbed into his bathtub, and he put a rifle in his mouth, and he shot his spring tub. This is, this is a direct result of being denied information about death or dignity. They also prohibited their hospice nurses and social workers from being present at the time of the a death with dignity, when a patient self-administers life administering medication. And this puts hospice staff in a difficult position. I mean, think about it. If you're a hospice nurse or social worker, you're going on a journey with your patient. From the beginning of the relationship to the end of the relationship. And yet, if your patient chooses to self-administer life administering life ending medicine, medication, you may not be present at the time of death. Nurses and social workers who have been 
prohibited, have told me they feel they have abandoned their patients at the time of death because of these rules. Let's talk about the impacts of these Catholic policies on death and dignity. The clear violation of patient autonomy and informed consent. Informed consent is one of the most important principles in the practice of medicine. The American Medical Association makes clear that patients are entitled to informed consent, that withholding referrals is unethical. And the American Medical Association opposes death with dignity and has opposed pretty much everything progressive in the last hundred years, including warning labels on cigarette packages. Mm. Abandoned. You know, if you tell a patient, if you can't help the patient, do you think this man who climbed in the bathtub didn't feel abandoned? Of course he was abandoned. He didn't have anyone to turn to for information. Providers are forced to violate professional standards and codes. I talked a little bit about physicians, but social workers. Social workers have a duty to talk to patients about any legal end-of-life option not to close down conversation. It violates the National Association of Social Workers' Code of Ethics. It violates their end of life policy. It's, uh, it violates policies around nursing. Um, it's wrong, wrong, wrong. Uh, I think I mentioned that certain areas of Washington are only s served by Catholic providers, and I'll show you a map later. So some of our clients are forced to travel long distances to see the two participating physicians required to qualify for them for the Death with Dignity Act. Death with Dignity process is delayed. And as many of you know who are familiar with hospice, people get into hospice late too. These referrals come late. And with Death with Dignity, it's not like someone shows up with a little black pill. It doesn't work that way. There's a minimum of 15 days between the first and the second floral requests. And for it to be 15 days, you would already have to have two participating physicians. So if a person comes to Compassion and Choices and said, we want to use the Death and Dignity Act, if they don't bring the doctors along with them, we have to find the two participating physicians. That takes time. So if people are delayed, often they'll die before they can survive the waiting period. Violent suicides, I've already talked about one example of that, and there have, been, there have been a couple in Washington, and we feel those are tragic and unnecessary. And people feel that, that injust, an injustice occurs. This, this is a photo of a woman named Audrey Roll. She's a fairly well-known artist. She lived in Bellingham, Washington until about two years ago. She. Uh, her husband, Norman Shapiro, died very badly uh, while in hospice care. A long drama of death, and perhaps he didn't receive intensive palliative care, or he wasn't offered the option of palliative sedation. And he died badly. And after he died, Audrey found out that he had the option of death with dignity, and she was outraged by that. And she met with the director of the hospice and said, why wasn't I provided? Why wasn't Norman given information about this? You know, is it, he didn't ask specifically for death with dignity, but over and over he said, isn't there a way that we can speed this up? I'm done here. My life is over. I'm just lying here waiting to die. Please help me. He was never offered information about the death with dignity act. And it turned into a front page story on the Sunday edition of the Bellingham Herald. And it shamed that hospice into providing information about its policies on death with dignity on the admissions uh, paperwork that they provide. So this is a really serious problem in Washington because Washington is dominated by three very large, very um, uh, well capitalized healthcare providers. Uh, Providence, uh, Catholic Health Initiatives under the name of Franciscan, which by the way is the fourth largest healthcare provider in the United States, and Peace Health. And in recent years, mergers and affiliations between Catholic facilities and secular facilities have been increasing. And when a 
Catholic facility merges, allies with, or forms an alliance with, or even sells to a secular facility, one of the ethical and religious directives is, is that the ethical and religious directives must still apply. So when a secular facility merges with a sectarian or non-religious affiliated facility, they're required to adopt the ethical and religious directives. So the expansion of Catholic-controlled healthcare in Washington has been significant. The dark blue counties in this graphic are counties where medical or the hospitals are 100% religiously affiliated. Now, Washington, many of you may not know, but the population of Washington is really around Puget Sound from its uh, body of water that sort of carves into the into the northwest portion of the state. There's, there's an old adage in Washington that I learned during the Initiative 1000 campaign is that on a clear day, you can see all the votes you need to pass an, in an initiative from the Space Needle. <laughs> and, and that's actually true. If you get enough of the vote, you can, you can win, because Eastern Washington is primarily unpopulated. There's, there's not a whole lot there. But look how, um, look how the Catholic um, institutions or controlled institutions are sort of um, sort of taking over in Washington. We're already at a point where nearly 50% of the Catholic uh, or acute care hospital beds are controlled by Catholic uh, entities. Um, so this is, a, this is a serious development. So um, the next two slides are resources, and it's my understanding that um, you'll have access to these programs once they're posted online, or if you've got our brochure, I would be happy to um, send you a copy of this presentation uh, with these resources listed as a PDF document attached so that you don't even have to have PowerPoint to look at it. So obviously we're listed Merger Watch, a national organization that's really paying close attention to what's happening nationally. And this isn't just a problem in Washington. This is happening nationally. Hospital mergers are, are really happening as a result of economic factors that are driving the expansion of medical, uh, medical care providers to, to join to improve efficiencies as a result of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, there are a lot of complex factors uh, that are contributing to these mergers, but they are happening. They'll continue to happen. And uh, Merger Watch is paying close attention when they happen with Catholic uh, facilities. Um, the ethical and religious directives, again, uh, interesting reading. You know, one of the things that uh, any of you who are considering um, an initiative or legislation in, in your own state, to, you know, know, know your enemy. And remember, the, there is only one real enemy to, to death with dignity uh, legislation and uh, initiatives in the United States, according to Eli Sussman, again, it's, it's the Catholic Church. Um, the ACLU of Washington has a real uh, nice web page with a lot of good information, and there's also a, another Washington organization called Catholic Watch. Now, I am not here to Catholic bash. In Washington State, uh, Catholic providers have been leaders in palliative care. Franciscan was one of the early leaders in the, in the movement to improve palliative care in the, in the entire United States. Um, Providence and other providers have been very active in the Physician Orders for Life Sustaining Treatment Program. I think maybe some of you heard that mentioned in one presentation. This is a, a non-hospital medical order that allows you to decline treatment, you know, such as CPR or medically assisted nutrition and hydration. Um, that you know, the, uh, they've been very active and supportive of the Pulse program. I know many uh, and work with many uh, clinicians who work for these organizations who don't agree with their employers' uh, policies, uh, including social workers and nurses who simply disregard their their rules and refer to compassionate choices or provide information, and uh, even at the threat of losing their jobs. So. 
Uh, there are many good people working in these organizations, and uh, these organizations have done a lot of good things in the communities in Washington. Uh, when it comes to death and dignity, though, though they, uh, they truly fall short. Uh, that's all I have to present. I think I've just about nailed it.
was a story in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, and in that report it recommended that these conversations between physicians and patients about their life -like choices were essential. I mean, were essential toward uh, preserving uh, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the, the reserves of, of Medicare, especially with this aging population. And then the second part of the uh, question, question was uh, related to you know, what can we do around this issue? What can we do to help uh, encourage progress on, in the area of end of life care? If I've, if, I've, uh, if I've done that justice to that. So I haven't read this report yet, but virtually every right thinking organization was in favor of including in the Affordable Care Act that Obama proposed was eventually enacted. A provision that reimbursed physicians for a conversation with patients once every five years about their end of life wishes. So currently, physicians are not reimbursed for having these conversations. They do them, and they often bill under some other code or something like that. But if they could bill for them, it would happen more frequently. That was the real by conservatives, led by a woman from Alaska, who will remain on me, um, because I don't want to publish, give any publicity. Um, and so, um, but recently, the conversation is recurring, and it looks like that provision is going to be enacted by regulation, um, and so it may, it may actually come to be. And uh, so, I think that that's essential. And I think it's essential for individuals, organizations to question politicians, educate politicians about this issue, make sure they understand your priorities around, uh, around end of life, around advanced planning, around honoring patients' choices. I mean, it's very important to, to educate, to talk about this, to make your uh, representatives understand your wishes. Um, you know, run for office, you know, send letters, you know, write an op-ed, you know, join an organization that's advocating for change because, and finally, support those organizations financially that are actually doing the work. The Deaf and Dignity National Center, Compassion and Choices of Washington, and if you believe in patient choice and um, you believe in the, the final exit network, that organization as well. Uh, they're less politically engaged, I think, than the Deaf and Dignity National Center, Compassion and Choices of Washington, but still a positive force. Thank you, Rob. Um, I know Rob would be happy to answer more questions, and I'm afraid they all have to be individual. Uh, I thank you for a very informative. I learned quite a bit. I also learned that what you talked about, redemptive suffering, is sort of like um, the good things that say this to your massacre. You turned to the good thing, long-playing guest from prostate cancer. Now, Marshall Perrin, the Chief Minister for the Northern Territory of Australia, and his parliament have given God this legal choice between two ways of dying, one paying for and one not. A um, few months prior to that, uh, Dr Chris Wake from the Northern Territory AMA and a reverend gentleman unsuccessfully sought an injunction in the Northern Territory Supreme Court then proceeded to the full court of the Supreme Court and ultimately the High Court to try and stop this proclamation of the rights of the Terminal Ill Act. Unsuccessfully. Um, now, we go on to March 27, 1997, and we have another yes. This time, Federal MP Kevin Andrews used an Asian Laws Bill uh, to overturn the right of the Northern Territory to retain the so-called Roti Act. Uh, it was passed by 38-33. Effectively, 
put in the Northern Territory and indeed the rest of Australia back into the previous century. So how was this achieved? Michael Gordon, the political editor of the Australian, in his article in 1997, The Alliance, um, had this to say. New South Wales had emerged as the um, state most likely to follow Northern Territory legislation. And so doctors, rights writers, nurses and others concerned with palliative care, some state MPs and others who had written articles against the E met to form a group called Euthanasia No. Included, as you would expect, was um, um, a guy who had um, strong connections with Cardinal Clancy of the Catholic Church, and a guy called John John o. Johnson, another Catholic, with extremely conservative views on social issues, ranging from divorce and censorship to abortion and euthanasia. And we have um, an interesting coalition, the Labor hack, uh, Tony Burke, joined forces with Kevin Andrews, who's a high-profile um, member of the, what's called the Lions Forum, a socially conservative group in the group of MPs. And this network, according to Gordon, would become one of the most effective political campaigns in recent Australian political history. Um, he, to quote, having a profile so low as to be almost subterranean was an integral part of the strategy. All of the principles for Catholics, it is a case study in the art of persuasion, with subtlety rather than intimidation and coercion being the secret of his success. Um, the group concentrated on the uh, slippery slope argument that uh, voluntary use in nature would lead to non-voluntary and then involuntary and the use of the words lethal injection. They were successful when with insufficient support for euthanasia in the New South Wales Parliament, euthanasia had known was about to wind up. And then we go over to the National Capital, Canberra. The office of the then Prime Minister had advised that the Northern Territory legislation was within the power of the Northern Territory and not a matter for disallowance. However, there was a change of government. And the new Prime Minister, John Howard, who was a conservative Christian, told a meeting that he was personally strongly opposed to euthanasia and Kevin Andrews took up the challenge to overturn the Northern Territory legislation. Um, the campaign was focused on the Senate Committee inquiry to examine Andrews' bill. The strategy was to encourage anyone who opposed his in Asia, um, including the Aborigine, Aboriginal and Disability Groups and palliative care organisations to make a submission. A record of more than 12,000 submissions that were generated, with 93% of them either supporting the Andrews Bill or opposing euthanasia. The Senate inquiry was clearly hijacked by those opposing. For instance, one of the four specific areas of inquiry was the desirability of the enactment of the provisions. And this original brief in the report became the more general moral, ethical and social arguments about euthanasia. Um, I just can't help but compare this with um, a Bill on each uh, Quebec inquiry. Um, opponents of voluntary euthanasia, as we would expect, had arguments based on the sanctity of life, religious beliefs, the impact of the old, the vulnerable and disabled, the strictly slow deterioration of social standards and erosion of medical ethics. The committee decided these had priority over individual rights, autonomy and um, freedom of choice. And concluded that um, laws relating to euthanasia are unwise and dangerous public policy in a comment on the evidence, uh, two senators disagreed and um, they said that the, um, some church leaders had compared Nazi atrocities with the right to return to the Northern Territory, as did Archbishop Hickey 
and others in what they call historical submissions. Um, so I turned to the encyclical of Pope John Paul on abortion and euthanasia to um, for a bit of background on this religious opposition. It's a lengthy document, but here are a few gleanings. The first, the, the murder of Asia by Cain, the first biblical murder, is somehow twisted into a reason why a terminally ill person should not make use of an assisted death. And I found it very hard to credit that a person such as Chantel, pleading for help to die, would gain much comfort from contemplating on Cain. Now, John 4, 2 says that, um, you can hear it, um, some of uh, Bob's uh, talk coming out again. I confirm that euthanasia is a, vi a grave violation of the law of God, since it is the deliberate and morally unacceptable killing of a human person. This doctrine is based on the natural law and upon the written word of God. And the natural law is written in the human heart. And it's an obligatory point of reference for civil law itself. Now, I'm no authority on what constitutes natural law, but there does seem to be some inconsistency here. For example, the US Supreme Court decision in 1837 determined that a woman could not become a qualified lawyer because the paramount destiny and mission of woman was to fulfill the noble and benign offices of wife and mother. And this is the law of the Creator. And the rules of civil society must be adapted to the general constitution of things and cannot be based upon exceptional uh, cases. Now, those who believe in the paternalistic intervention of God could also believe that God does and can cause earthquakes and floods. That fill in the divine law seen as one. As a result of earthquakes, buildings fall down according to the law of nature, gravity, often killing many people. The basic grand view of nature and natural law is that it's not related to the supernatural. Confusing, isn't it? The encyclical states that suicide is always morally objectionable as murder. It's a great sin. But even this is complex when you think it through. If a person knows and has been clearly and reliably informed that by taking a certain action and by following a certain path, this would certainly result in their death, and yet they persist in doing this action and die, that would reasonably be deemed suicide. Yet Jesus did just this by travelling the road to Jerusalem to his crucifixion. What's more, he did it at the command of his father. As others more theologically qualified than I have pointed out, surely the ultimate in trial of this. <laughs> Add the fact of the Holy Trinity, and it becomes even more complicated. I'd just like to touch on one other, one other aspect of this insight, for all such uh, that suffering. We read that the Pope praises a person who forgoes painkillers, causing, causing heroic behaviour, and saying that suffering, all of evil and trial in itself, can always be a source of good. Um, to say that needless suffering is heroic, um, men would find patronising or offensive, as I do. Um, most thinking people would find it impossible to equate extreme suffering with the concept of a loving and compassionate God. Um, my unnamed fan here is an exception. A rather poetical vision of death is held, rather than typical. Oh, wait. <laughs> and uh, um, I've got that in my files. Actually, we've received very few uh, really anti-deaths like that. Um, there seems to be very little in the encyclical in true empathy for the suffering of individuals. So the church dogma and selected biblical quotes take preference. 
So how does this translation to the nitty gritty of current church opposition to um, compassionate choice and assisted dying in Australia? Um, the New South Wales um, member of the Legislative Council, Kate Feynman, said in 2013, prior to the debate on her rights to return the new bill, she expected a repeat of the forceful campaigning of the Catholic Labour right and the Catholic Church has seen in other states. And another fellow MP, John Kay, said during the debate on this bill, some objections are emerging from a purely dogmatic, narrow point of view. Many of the arguments are relied on misleading and downright mendacious tactics, and none more than Cardinal George Pell in his letter of the 8th of May on behalf of the Catholic bishops of New South Wales. The letter contains four substantial lies. It is a deliberate attempt by the Cardinal to mislead the people of New South Wales and in particular his flock. Cardinal Pell states that despite talk of a dignified death, dignity is not served by telling the old and dying through our laws that they will be better off dead. And we would be better off if they were there. And that wasn't in any way a part of the group. Now, the Anglican Synod of New City in 2010 expressed opposition along predictable lines. They state that palliative care was sufficient except for the tiny minority, but had no empathy for the, that minority. They alleged that legislation would lead to patient mistrust, creeping expansion, which is funding for PC, and that most supporters for euthanasia were young and healthy, none of which is supported by data. Um, in an explanation of Parliament in May 2013, uh, Kay Payman said, in an explanation, um, Dr. Catherine Lennon attended the briefing that I held for members on my rights to determine the bill. She had not been invited in her own right, although that's how she identified herself. After she left the briefing, Dr. Lennon made two telephone calls to the Australasian College of Emergency Medicine to complain that uh, Dr. Lee, who had been at the presentation, made a statement to the effect that all emergency specialists are trained in euthanasia. Obviously, that's a complete lie. What she didn't um, ex explain to Parliament was that um, she was a founder and board member, along with her husband, of Make a Care Australia, a non-profit Catholic organisation that specifically enjoins medical professionals to act as prophetic witnesses by reflecting on the teaching and practice of contemporary medical care in the light of the gospel and its values most recently presented in the encyclical. Um, she gave the impression that in Oregon patients were being euthanized uh, because they were simply depressed. Also from Kate, Reverend Fred Nile, another member of the Legislative Council, um, quotes from an article by Peter Saunders, and he says there's a stunning 4,620 percent increase in Belgian euthanasia cases in the ten years since legislation. Obviously wrong. Uh, New South Wales Premier uh, lashed out at Cardinal Pell again for denouncing Catholic politicians who do not follow the uh, church's teaching on gay marriage and euthanasia. Some of you might be aware that um, Cardinal Pill has been promoted to um, the Vatican now to uh, work out the finances for the Vatican. Um, we have uh, the Liverpool member for the same parliament, David Clark, also known as an overstated cooperator, agreeing with the Cardinal, um, saying you can't just use your religion when you want to. Um, the Australian Christian Lobby is a sort of a political group to ours, and um, 
He called and said, um, I'm worried about the effect of sick and elderly and vulnerable people. You cannot produce a safe euthanasia law. Where it is, we can introduce euthanasia and assisted suicide. Whatever safeguards are in place, um, they have always been circumvented. We have instances overseas where not just dozens, but hundreds, and sometimes thousands of patients are being killed by their doctors without request for euthanasia or any explicit consent given. Really? Um, move on to other uh, more recently defeated bills in Australia. This, this, as been said earlier in this conference, there have been many bills. Um, some are very close. Um, the South Australian Greens LLC Terry Franks um, in 2010 said that the defeat followed a highly organised campaign by conservatives working along party religious and state lines. Um, in the same parliament, um, a religious based Family First Party um, in debate incorrectly stated that the Washington State DWD referendum was passed with a 46% vote in his efforts to denigrate public support for sister dying. And in Victoria, the speaker, Ken Smith, quoted the saying that the political debate of euthanasia has been retarded by religious fanaticism. Um, two minutes, please. Two, okay, I'll get a head on a bit. Um, I'm getting there. Um, I'll go on to the next one. How far will our religious opposition go? Let you read it. Our friends Alex Schadenberg, I think you recognise that name, and they managed to manipulate the poll. Um, uh, Paul Russell happens to be not only the director of No Euthanasia, but a, a Catholic. Um, in uh, Maybe we've had a similar problem, but not so much with the Catholics there, actually. It's the um, Anglican bishop there um, used similar arguments to Cardinal Pim in Sydney. And this bill was very um, close. It was defeated by nine votes to 11 after the Speaker absented himself from the chair so that he could vote against it. Um, Two other points. Um, in this Tasmanian bill, another conservative fundamentalist uh, Christian um, was guilty of blatant misrepresentation of the facts. Um, for example, uh, she said the Oregon 2013 report indicates that being a burden on family, family, uh, friends, and caregivers is the major reason for increasing assisted suicide for 38.6% of those who have died versus 23.5% for inadequate pain control. Of course, what she didn't quote was that the three major reasons, loss of autonomy, decreasing ability to participate, and loss of dignity. It seems that nothing is beyond the religious right to block reform so desperately needed by the vast majority of the community. The tactics often include lying reception, yet they seem to get away with it time and time again. Very similar to what's happening worldwide on the program. say one thing and allow palliative 
sedation at the end of life. Well, I don't think at all of that. One of the questions that I'll ask for quite a few meetings, um, if, if the person has, um, is in such a state of health that they require to have a sedation, um, how many of them would prefer the option of having sedation and taking some time to die, even if they're in a coma, or being able to say, give me a big dose now, get it over and done with? To me, it's just um, totally, well, it's inexplicable. Right mm. now, I can say why. <laughs> well, the Catholic justification for terminal or palliative sedation is based on. Um, the Thomas Aquinas' Doctrine of Double Effect. Yes. And the Doctrine of Double Effect is a complex piece of sophistry, but essentially it says that if your intention is to relieve suffering, uh, then if you actually are hastening death, as long as it is your intention to relieve suffering, that that is uh, sufficient justification. You are not committing a sinful act. Uh, many, many Catholics would say that is bulldust, um, and, and many, many ethicists say that that's a very dubious proposition. And um, Roger Hunt, who's a palliative care physician in Australia, says that if it wasn't clear that death was being hastened, there was no need to, hit, to justify the uh, terminal sedation by the doctrine of double effect. So it, it's all uh, a load of crap. Essentially, you can give the same medication and if you say that it's to relieve the pain, it's okay, but if you said that you were helping to hasten the person's death with the same medication, you'd be viable. Thank you. Thanks again. And uh, Sean? Uh, Sean Davis, and most of you know that uh, because Sean presented uh, yesterday uh, about his situation when he was uh, prosecuted and persecuted, I believe, in Australia, I mean in New Zealand, for, <laughs> the, for the death of his mother. Uh, Sean is from He's lived in uh, Cape Town now and had the uh, distinct privilege, I would say, to be supported by Desmond Tutu. And he is going to share with us now an interview that I'm sure will be a message we will enjoy. Thank you, Sean. Listen. 
etc. It's only saying what he said in his article in the, in the Observer two months ago. He had As you would have read in that article, he expressed his the fact that he had changed his way of thinking. Previously, he had been focusing on issues relating to the living, and only now he was applying his mind to the dying. This is the consequences of both myself and Helena Dolly. She's our chief person in the front row. Way we gang, Helena. Uh, we both got an ear to Desmond Tutu. And through several meetings, we kept raising the issues about death and dying. Um, obviously, Desmond Tutu knew my story after he'd written the court to get a lenient sentence. Helena Dolby, her husband, who did it, now she's a widow, was a man called Joe Slover, one of the leading architects in the freedom struggle in South Africa. His name is mentioned along with Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu. Very, very famous leader in the country. So Helena had an ear to Desmond Tutu and also began talking to him about these issues. And now he's applied his mind to the issues around dying, which has helped our campaign a great deal, <coughs> leading to this article in the Observer. And now for the first time he spoke on video, basically saying the same things. I can start telling some jokes here, I'll be like. Oh, you know what, well, also, that, that lady who came in before, who warned us about the protests, is it? Oh, you're yeah, protesters. We're going to make fun of him right here. No, no, we're going to make fun of him. We warned about the dangers of going outside. I spent an hour this morning talking to the people out there, one by one, in their wheelchairs, and they are so appreciative, polite, and courteous, that somebody had my name tagged on, they just wanted to be heard. They come from all over the states. Some come from Canada, one come from Mexico. Um, so I don't think it's a real threat. Of course, one person. It's not them. It's not, not them. It's okay. not them. Not them. Okay, there are other people <laughs> hiding there. <laughs> there might be a threat. But I, I had a great hour out there this morning as well. And apparently somebody came up, Julia Halloway came to me and said, a man had broken through the security and come upstairs looking for the man from South Africa to come back down and talk to me. Yeah, yeah, fine, you will get back in there. Okay, so like